is actually something destined to happen. Um, and so digging back into the history of trade prior to the Opium War, so I decided to anchor the book with the Opium War at the end. It, it, it takes place in the last couple of chapters and decide on the starting point, and then you begin filling in the spaces in between. And as far as the research, there's, there are oceans of sources um, that can be used for a project like this, both in Chinese and in English. I have mean, huge amounts of archival materials in both languages. Um, in terms of my own style as a historian, I like people. Um, I like following individual people and understanding why they do what they do. Um, especially when they do things you don't expect, or if, you do, or if they do things you wish they wouldn't, um, and trying to understand why in their own power, in their own mind, you're rationalizing that. So I think that a lot of the research I did was in letters, in diaries, um, in reports home from various officials and traders. Um, the really the the most wonderful sources I had to work with, I think, were the were um, generally they were diaries and letters, some of which hadn't really ever been used before. Um, I don't know if any, uh, well actually, just to get a quick baseline here, how familiar are you all with the basic story of the Opium War? Is this an audience that, mm -hmm. hand up? Um, hands up, hand, hands up if you haven't really learned about it at all, I can give you the, okay, so the, the Let me stop you for a second, yeah. Aaron, this is, this is not working, but. Not working at all? Now it is. Okay. And for the sake of the tape, you know, the, the recording, should we use the mics? Oh, please. It's probably better to use mics. Okay. So, yeah. All right, so go ahead. Do you start <laughs> Tell us about the Opium War. Um, just in a nutshell, the, the Opium War, um, one of the most shockingly unjust wars in the history of imperial wars. Um, in 1839, and this again is the nutshell, um, China cracked down on British opium dealers who had been carrying opium from India and selling it along the coast to Chinese buyers. Um, and on the pretext of that crackdown, Britain went to war against China. Um, in its own time, morally absurd grounds for a war. And I mean, we can talk about how they actually justified it to a public that was really outraged at what was being done. The um, British public. The British public. Yeah, yeah. yeah there, was, there was actually far, I mean, it was far more controversial than I had thought. You learn about this in Chinese history courses as, well, of course the British did this. This is what the British do. They go off and they conquer other countries. Um, but when you actually go back to the time and see what was going on in Britain at the time, and especially that the government, the British government that went to war in China, um, is the same one that had just abolished slavery and considered itself a moral exemplar in the Western world. Um, how do you go from abolishing slavery to just a few years later going to war in favor of drug dealers? So that, that's one of the, the questions of this book. Um, in terms of the specific question about sources, um, I'd say there are two individuals in here um, where just they were my absolute favorite sources to work with. One is a man named Lord Napier who in 1834 was Great Britain's very first official on the ground in Canton, in China. Um, the monopoly of the East India Company had been abolished. British traders were free to go and trade in China, and, and Britain needed somebody there to sort of keep track of them. Um, he goes over and he winds up practically starting a war and calling in gunboats, and then he dies. Um, I had, I, there, there hadn't been really much to say about him, um, except that I assumed that he was sort of a victim of circumstance. Somebody got in over his head, um, reacted badly to, situ to a situation that erupted in Canton. Um, but I, he was, I guess he was the ninth Lord Napier. I, I got the 15th Lord Napier, the current Lord Napier, um, to share his great, 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 great grandfather's diaries and letter book from when he went to China. He still had them in his little Cambridgeshire home. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I spent the day going through these. And my lord, Lord Napier was the author of his own demise. Um, that it was absolutely shocking how candid he was in his diary. Already by the time he left England, never having been in China before, on the boat over, on the ship over, he's keeping a diary, reading everything that's been written in English about China. He has already come to the conclusion that what China needs is a good war. <laughs> and that he could be the man to break it open. And really the most baldly imperialistic proposals I had ever come across from a, from a subject of Great Britain 
Um, he gets it into his head that all you need is a small fleet targeting the right areas, um, and the Chinese, the ethnic Chinese, the Han Chinese will rise up, and together the British and the Chinese will overthrow the Manchus, send them back north of the Great Wall. And he's writing about this on um, shipboard. And then, and then we can establish a Chinese emperor on the throne answering to British power behind the scenes. So in other words, so he's already all set to try to turn China into India. Indian Raj. Yeah. yeah. And so I mean, he was, he was finding things like that. I think. That all right. So before we before we go on to talk about, you know, I think you need to hold it a little bit closer. Oh, okay. about. Right. <laughs> um, but before we um, go on to talking about the the importance of the opium war and why this matters and stuff, I do want to ask you one more, can yeah. I talk a little bit about one more character? You start the book, I guess, about 100 years earlier, right? Because yeah. one poor guy who's the only James Englishman Clinton. who speaks Chinese. So tell a little bit about his story. He has really kind of a tragic yeah. story, but it's unbelievable. Yeah, he's the very first character who appears in the book. His name is James Flint. Um, and in 1759, he was the only, the only British person alive who could speak Chinese. Um, and he had this really unfortunate life. He was an orphan. He had been carried over to China by a ship's captain um, who dropped him off in Canton at about, he was about eight years old at the time, dropped him off, told him, try to learn the language, see if you can make, some, make use of yourself to the East India Company. I'll come and pick you up later. Um, the, a couple of years. So a couple of years later, he hears from the ship's captain saying, OK, come over and meet me in India. Sails for Bombay, the ship's captain dies at a sh shipwreck. And this orphan boy shows up in India with no money and nobody to take care of him. And the British authorities put him on a boat back to Canton. But he, wanted to, sort of, he grows up really as a child of the East India Company. He's raised by the East India Company traders. Um, he grows a queue like a chain subject. Um, while the British ships are in port, he wears British clothing, and when the British ships leave, he wears the, the, the robes of a Chinese person. Um, so he became bilingual, an absolutely unique person in his own time. Yeah, okay, so by that point, so he and actually. We'll talk about the, why the so things go well for James Flynn this for a while. This book is so good because <laughs> yeah. it's written about all these characters. Um, he gets to be an East Indian Company trader, he starts making money for himself. I mean, all the records for this are at the British Library, and you know, he, gets, he gets voted to being a supercargo, which is one of the traders. Um, but then the, 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 the fateful event for James Flint is in 1759, the Chenglong Emperor starts making noises about restricting all British trade to Canton. And the East India Company decides to send James Flint to petition the Emperor up in Beijing. Um, and never so, a good thing. Never a good thing. But James Flint composes a petition to the Emperor in Chinese with the help of his Chinese teacher. This is something sort of close to home for the Chinese teacher. So his teacher helps him to write this petition, asking to open more ports to the British. Um, he actually succeeds in getting all the way up the coast, bribes somebody um, a huge amount of money to get him as far as Tianjin, um, where one of the officials actually transmits his memorial to the Chenglong Emperor. Um, Chenglong gets it, um, and there's various complaints. The, the British complain that the officials in Canton are corrupt, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so Chen Long sends him back down through China with an imperial commissioner um, to figure out who the corrupt officials in Canton are and get them removed. Right, so the good news is the corrupt officials get arrested. So they get arrested. So things are going well for James Flynn. Um, you know, he's, been on the, he's been through the interior of China, which no Englishman had ever done before. Um, then comes another edict, essentially blaming James Flint for having violated the laws of the empire, for having taken a foreign ship into ports where they were not allowed, for having petitioned the emperor despite having no status as a subject of the empire. Um, and so Flint is arrested. Um, he's thrown into prison for three years um, in a prison near Macau. There's nothing the East India Company can do to get him out. Um, and then when, when he finally is released from prison, they stick him on a boat and send him back home to England. And I think, as I say in the book, they're, they're rendering useless the one skill that he has, yeah. which is to be yeah. able to speak Chinese. Yeah. Um, things are actually better for him than for his Chinese teacher. Exactly. 
because no for China Institute teachers. And this is actually it's an important issue all the way through here, which is that foreigners who got into trouble in China, as long as they didn't kill somebody, the worst they could expect is to be banished. And actually, aside from James Flint, I didn't come across anyone else who was even put in prison. That foreigners who made trouble, if they killed somebody, they would be held responsible in China. Otherwise, they would just be sent home. So James Flint gets sent home. It's the main concern of the emperor is not the foreigners themselves, but the Chinese who consort with them and conspire with them. So as Chen Wang saw it, James Flint never could have made his way up to Tianjin or written this petition if, if sort of treacherous Chinese subjects had not helped him learn the language. So James Flint's teacher was executed. Exactly. And effectively, it became illegal going forward for any Chinese person to teach their language to a foreigner. Yeah. Um, and James Flint, um, James Flint the, uh, there are various Chinese sources on James Flint that say that he died right after he got out of prison. Um, the, the, the one document that I found that shows that he was alive, he shows up a few years later teaching Benjamin Franklin how to make tofu. So, oh, yeah, yeah. That so. oh my god. Okay, so, so that's James a little bit about the turning to the significance. So at the very beginning of the book, you talk about how the world, you feel the world has looked at the Opium War and at modern China, essentially, incorrectly, because the way we tend to look at it is that the Opium War is kind of the beginning of modern history. Yeah. And you say that it's really important to instead put into the context of the centuries that predated it. And that's what you do a lot with your book. Um, so explain a little bit what you meant by that and, and how it sort of uh, turns around the way we look at China. The China that America has known um, since the 19th century was what was the post-opium war China. Um, the China that was bullied in the 19th century, um, that was invaded by the Japanese in the 20th century, one that was always dealing with either internal turmoil um, or foreign invasion. And as China began to piece itself back together in recent decades, and as it becomes stronger and as it builds its military, there's this sense almost of surprise that how you know that China is some sort of an upstart, or it doesn't you know, that, you know, that China cannot be good. That we we taken the Opium War and the China that came after it as being sort of the essence of China, which isn't of course the case at all. Um, and the, what I wanted to do in this book is look back towards the previous era when China was strong, when China was central. Um, this is the era that Xi Jinping is nostalgic for now. But this is the lost glory of China that must be regained, and I think he sees it being regained by about 2050. Um, but to understand that, that the opium war ends a certain era, and the, era, and the new era that we are entering into now, China is stronger and more confident. The government is more confident than any that we have seen since before the opium war. And if we're going to be sort of looking for clues as to what a relationship might be like in the future, we need to consider how things worked back when China was strong before before the opium problem, before the war. That's fascinating, and the idea that the 150 years of humiliation are not the norm for China. But those, yeah. you know, there was a lot that came before that that was really great, and I think that yeah. Americans and Westerners in general don't quite get that. They don't really yeah. understand that. But, you know, I think it's also worth, worth noting that the, I mean, Xi Jinping very much trades on that. So I mean, for, for Xi Jinping, the Opium War is, is a central you know, origin of that, you know, almost yes. as much as something like the Long Marshall happens in the 20th century. So the idea for Xi Jinping is that the, the, the Opium War initiates this century of humiliation, and it's only the Communist Party that's able to achieve, um, to get over that, in effect. So I mean, one of Xi Jinping's very first speeches after he comes Power, right? He makes a speech at the military college in Beijing, and he says, you know, to, to remember the lesson. Basically, it's about the Opium War, um, and to point out that China has been humiliated for all this time, and that now it's, it's recovering. That only thanks to the Communist Party. So I mean, we'll get into this more later on. But the, yeah. the role of nationalism is something that, yes, the West definitely trades on that image of China as you know, looking at this as lens of weakness. But the, the, the present Chinese government also relies on that as demonstration that it is um, the way to, to strengthen. China. Right, certainly, and relentlessly playing up the humiliation of the last 150 years. Yes, absolutely. Um, 
So a little bit more about the sort of details, specifics of the Opium War. So the Brits and others traded for, with China for several centuries before the war broke out. So what, you know, what happened? When, what are the lessons that we can learn from the war? What went so wrong? Oh, everything went wrong. Um, <laughs> But really, I mean, up until up until the 1830s, which is when the opium problem just completely deranged the trade between Britain and China, things actually worked very smoothly over the long haul. Um, that it was a very limited trade. The British and Americans were only allowed to trade at Canton, this one city in southern China. They weren't even allowed to go into the city. They had they were stuck in a little compound outside. Um, but Britain supplied its entire, every, you know, all of its tea came from China. This is the only place in the world they could buy tea. Um, silver flowed into China and helped stabilize the economy in the 18th century. That this, for a very long period, this was actually a very mutually, I mean, China loves to talk about mutually beneficial trade. This was actually a very mutually beneficial trade until the rise of opium came along. Um, and all along there had been British traders who wished they had access to other ports. Um, so after James Flint, trade is formally restricted to Canton. So from 1760 up until the end of the Opium War, all British trade has to go to Canton. And really, the, I mean, people talk about the Opium War as if, it's, it, as if it was meant to force China to accept opium. It didn't really do that. The treaty did not legalize opium. Opium was already a smuggling trade, and they could sell it wherever they wanted. What it did was force open ports to legal British goods, things like cotton textiles being made in Britain, in hopes that British manufacturers would finally get to you know, redress the trade imbalance. Um, yeah. So I mean, all, all of which is to say that uh, the trade, the, the things that went wrong, happened in a fairly short period of time, and the tumble into war came from a, uh, from a series of completely unprecedented events which were largely dictated by individuals who happened to make very dramatic decisions about what to do on the ground in the year in 1838, 1839. And when the war actually came, nobody had expected it. Um, because it happened, we tend to imagine that it must have been inevitable and everything must have been leading up to this. But for decades, there had been you know, occasional, very aggressive British traders who tried to cook up some kind of a pretext for the Royal Navy to come over to China and open up some ports for them. And every single time the British government pulled them back and either admonished them that you need to follow the laws of China, you were guests in that country, you need to behave yourselves, or if they worked for the East India Company, they were generally fired and sent back home. That the consistent position of the British government all the way up to the actual outbreak of war was that British merchants had better behave themselves in China because this is an extremely lucrative market. We don't want to do anything to lose it. I mean, even, I mean, even a, a, just a year before the war broke out. So Lord Palmerston is the great villain of the war. He's the foreign secretary who actually launches this war and dictates the terms of it. Um, just a year before it broke out, he issued very clear instructions to the superintendent, the British superintendent, um, that the government would not do anything to support British who violated China's laws. So that anyone, and, and said quite clearly that any British subjects um, who are smuggling opium and should suffer because China should crack down and enforce its laws <coughs> must suffer their own consequences. Um, so it was, it was completely unexpected that just a year later they would use that actually as a pretext for the war. I mean, I'll just say that there had been plenty of incidents previously that the British government could have used as a pretext for war, and they had a naval advantage going all the way back to at least the 1790s. This wasn't, a, there were no military questions in this war. The British knew that the Royal Navy was much more powerful than the Chinese Navy. Um, the ultimate question really is a moral one. How, how did they finally, in the end, decide that it was correct to use that name in China? And to imagine that you could open trade at the point of a gun, which was as counterintuitive then as it is now. So yeah, I wanted to pick up on um, the, those tensions that you described between the merchants on the ground in Canton and the government back home in England. Um, and I wonder if you both might talk a little bit about how, how the merchants and business generally define the relationship with 
um, and what role they played in the they played in the expansion of the British, uh, you know, British imperialism there, both in Canton and in Shanghai. I mean, I think I guess where I would start first is a more general point, which is I think something about the book and I think about the approach to history that I think Steve and I sort of share. I think this book really illustrates super well. Um, is that there's you know there are these big arcs that we all learn about in, in, in history classes or books and you know big big events big processes that sometimes take years sometimes take decades sometimes take centuries um, but then they're only they're only meaningful in the context of individual lives and individual people um, and I think that's one thing this book does super well um, so the idea that not only the, the opium war but the whole notion of trade with China and Britain's expansion and, and China's decline and those are enormous concepts and we can't really make sense of people's lives without knowing those big concepts, but at the same time, those big concepts I think are pretty meaningless unless we see how they play out in the lives of individuals. And the individuals in this case that you see a lot are these are these particular traders. I'm fascinated in, in I mean, we'll talk a little bit later about what goes on in Shanghai later on is what I'm researching right now. But in, I mean, what was your sense Steve, in terms of how, um, you know, to what extent did these individuals I mean, just individual men, Chinese and British, living in, you know, and a couple of women as well, but most of them were living on, in, in Canton. Um, I mean, how is it there that they really managed to manipulate, well, maybe you disagree, but manipulate the, the face of these entire, these great empires around the world just for their own sort of personal gain? Yeah, I mean, they, again, all along, you can find individuals on the ground. I mean, I, 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 I mean, yeah, actually, just to back up for a moment, that British imperialism vis-a-vis -vis China does not happen because of some grand master plan put in effect by the British government, and now we will take pieces of China. Um, that th this is very much ad hoc. It's individual merchants getting themselves into trouble and begging for help back home, and then the government back home deciding whether actually they're they are morally justified in providing help or not. Um, and this is, this is where, again, I was very surprised to see how consistent the British government had been all the way through the 1800s, 1810s, 1820s, 1830s um, at not responding to these calls from individual traders to send in a gunship and defend various, various insults that they had suffered. Um, that, that the war itself actually is quite normal compared to the history before it. Um, but as far as these individuals, who are the ones who are, are sort of howling at the gates of China? Um, a huge amount of changes in 1834. Um, prior to 1834, the East India Company has a British monopoly on all trade with China. Um, and I, don't, I hesitate to say anything good about the East India Company. Uh, this, is, this is the company that conquered India. The, 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 the private company with its own army and its own navy. If you look at the East India Company in India, it's a force of conquest. If you look at the East India Company in China, what you have is a very small collection of polite bean counters. That the East India personnel who were in Canton, by and large, behaved themselves, followed the rules, and made huge amounts of money on the basis of that, because they had this comfortable monopoly where they were raking in money by monopolizing the tea trade back to England. And the government in England loved that because they got 100% tax on all of that tea. But the issue is that the British who went to, like, like young Britons who wanted to go work for the East India Company, the ones who had the dreams of conquest and, and, and expanding territory and, and rule and war, and all, they were drawn to India. The ones who found their way to Canton were a completely separate group. There wasn't, there wasn't circulation between them. And occasionally you would have you would have somebody with the mindset of British India who would wind up in Canton and inevitably would start causing trouble through their arrogance, through their through their unwillingness to follow precedent, and they're the ones who caused trouble and got recalled back home, or they got kicked out by the other traders. So up until 1834, because the British at Canton are part of the East India Company, they are accountable to the company back home. And the directors are quite conservative as far as China is concerned. And they are constantly reminding them they have to behave themselves. It's the rise of free trade in Britain that changes this. And in 1834, the East India Company loses its charter. It loses its monopoly on the China trade. And free trade activists from all over Britain uh, now get to launch themselves into the China trade. 
So what happens is after 1834, suddenly you have a free-for-all of independent British firms sending ships to China for the China trade, unaccountable to anybody, competing with each other, and the relations start to sour almost immediately. The people who live through this talk about the racism of the newcomers, the aggression of the newcomers. These are individuals who are out for profit at any cost. They look leap eagerly into the, into the opium smuggling trade along the coast. Um, and they are the ones, that, I mean, the, you know, the, the pinnacle are Jardine and Matheson, um, who you know, are, their names are all over Hong Kong. Um, their company, their opium smuggling firm is now, you know, what is it, it's got something like 400,000 employees worldwide. It's a huge place for multinational conglomerate. Um, but they got their start selling opium along the coast of China. They are the ones who are most so strongly behind the war powers. Yeah. Okay. I mean, they were they were there through the uh, the so-called country trade that they could trade between India and China. Mm -hmm. And again, the the reason you can have these quiet bean counters for the East India Company in Canton is that when the opium trade really does ramp up, which happens in in the 1820s and especially in the 1830s, um, the East India Company is wary of taking any opium to China in its own ships. So absolutely not, not a single ounce of opium goes to China on an East India Company ship. That doesn't mean they don't profit. What they do is they grow it under monopoly in their own territories of India. They sell it in Calcutta at auction to these country traders, people like Jardine and Matheson, and also a lot of Indian traders, like Parsis especially, um, who they would take the risk of carrying the opium to the coast of China they were the ones who had networks of Chinese criminal guilds who would buy it from them and distribute it in China. Um, and the East India Company could just, so the ones in Canton at least, um, there's one of them testifying to Parliament, and he can say with a straight face that in 30 years at Canton he has never seen a chest of opium himself. That is entirely plausible, because the dirty work was being done by the country traders. So it's the kind of individuals who are in the country trade who surged to the fore in 1834. The company is removed. Um, they're the ones who start finding all kinds of excuses to try to try to get the gunships in. Um, they're turned down. They're turned down. They're turned down. And then you have Lindsay Shu and Charles Elliott and the explosion, and finally they get their way. Okay, so 1939, yeah. the war happens. So yeah. what? What led the British to believe that they could succeed by sending this tiny fleet and a few thousand soldiers to make war on the largest empire in the world? Isn't it absurd? It seems pretty crazy. So Think what, about what that. were they thinking? What was their calculation? This is, I mean, this is a really crucial aspect of the war. Again, we take the war as inevitable because it happened. But if you look at what the critics were saying at the time, and if you look at what the British government believed prior to 1839, it was that here is the largest empire on Earth. About one third of the world's population was, in, was inside the Qing, the Qing Empire. How, you know, certainly Britain had much better ships, but how can you possibly prevail in a war against an empire of that size? And I mean, going all the way back to Lord McCartney, who was Britain's first ambassador to China in 1792, this sort of famously failed embassy where he refused to kowtow, um, he even recognized that with a small fleet from the Royal Navy, you could effectively shut down China's coastal trade. That China's coastal defenses were so weak, its navy was so weak, that you could throttle the trade, you could choke the commerce of the South, and you could reduce as you, you could reduce the inhabitants of southern China to famine within months. Um, and he writes about this in his diary. And he says, but, and this is the important but, because this is the but that everyone after him also sees. He says, but then the emperor would simply shut us out of the China trade. Britain would lose its access to tea. And what could we possibly gain from any show of force in China? And this is echoed over and over and over. Somebody, some merchant will say, well, we've been insulted. The, you know, this official in Canton sat down with his back facing the portrait of our former king. And how can we tolerate this horrible insult? Please avenge our honor. Um, and, you know, and, and the government would say, no, this is absurd. That the worst thing we could do is use force in China. So I mean, that question of what made the British in the end imagine that they could succeed with a tiny focus work. 
So much depends on what the British learn about China in the interim. Right, so what were they learning and how did they learn it? It's as, they, as British subjects began learning the language, especially missionaries learned it, as they started trying to get into the country, the missionaries were leading the way on this as well, Protestant missionaries. As, as China itself weakened, um, this, is, this is also a very important thing to keep in mind, that the, op the Opium War is talked about in Chinese history as if China was strong, 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 then suddenly Britain came along and bam, China became weak. Britain did not weaken China. Britain took advantage of China's existing weakness. There had been terrible, there, had been, there was a, a terrible problem of overpopulation, horrible problems of government corruption. Um, the treasuries had been bankrupted by the White Lotus Rebellion and internal rebellion. And it was, the, it was the British learning about these things. It was British who secretly got into the country and traveled and recorded back, and this was the most crucial thing that they recorded back. They recorded back that Actually, all the Chinese want free trade with the British. And the only thing standing in their way is this corrupt government of Manchus of the Qing Dynasty. And the promise from those intelligence reports, which became the logic of the war, which made Palmerston think that he could send a small fleet and a few thousand soldiers and prevail in China, it was based on a belief that what the mass of people in China wanted was an opening to Britain that all of the merchants of China dreamed of trade with the British, and that in effect they could drive a wedge between the government of China and its people. So rather than sparking boycotts and getting shut out of the, out of the China market, they had received arguments from, the, from these various reports saying that actually the emperor, the emperor no longer has the power to wave his hand and shut down trade. The Chinese will just get around that and they'll still trade with us. Look at what's going on with the opium trade. It's illegal. Um, but by the 1830s, you have Chinese reports that saying that you know, when one of the foreign opium ships appears along the shore in Fujian province, it does not encounter naval enforcers. It encounters thousands of Chinese on the shore whistling to it in hopes that it will land and sell to them. And so it was this faith, and you, know, you can hear this echo you know, in the Iraq war, that we will be welcomed by the Iraqi people with open arms. Um, it was based on a similar kind of a promise, that the people of China would not be offended if Britain fought a pinpointed war against the Qing dynasty, that they could crack the government and, the, and then trade would take over and everyone would become rich. And sadly, China was fractious enough at the time that the war was able to succeed without massive boycotts, without the, all the Chinese people turning against right. the British. So I have a couple of questions to follow up on that. You know, one is, what are the lessons for us all to take from the Opium War? And the other one is, what do you think is the lesson that Xi Jinping takes from the Opium War? I mean, right? If you're Xi Jinping, but go ahead. I think, I think one of the lessons, to answer your first question, I think one of the lessons that I think gets buried a little bit, but I think it's... Okay, the East India Company, and you're right, the East India Company comes off. I mean, the East India Company is just sort of a... I mean, they're sort of forced for good in this story in, in, in China because they represent the norm. And this norm emphasizes stability. And I think there are lessons for all of us in this in today's world. So, and that everybody was happily trading, everything was going well. What are the old things? Which you say that things were always perfect, but the, yeah. the East India Company wanted not, didn't want anything to happen that was going to destabilize the trade. Mm -hmm. And so therefore they avoided things like going to war. I mean, you see that you've pointed out several times. So there were definitely people who were frustrated with their inability to trade more and to trade in different places and trade wherever they wanted to. But ultimately, the company, whenever somebody ventured too far, became too uh, hawkish, or tried to, to, to too overtly violate Chinese laws, they called them back and they stopped it. And I think, this, I think we've seen this in a lot of different countries in the last couple of years, right? Where that it's not necessarily law that is always the most important thing, preventing people from doing stuff that has bad consequences, but norms. And I think that the East India Company was ahead of norm towards stability that when that goes, so when in 1834 when that 
teaching history in the proper way, um, that it's uh, that I mean, it is very crucial for China to have to have to try to avoid the kind of divisions that in the past made it so exploitable <coughs> through the 19th century, when you have sort of divisions between Han Chinese and Manchus, between the merchants and peasants, between people from even from different provinces. Um, but the I mean. I mean, the Opium War also becomes sort of denatured. It becomes just sort of the generalized <coughs> starting point of the era of humiliation. The actual Opium War itself wasn't such a big deal in its own time. Um, it, in, in, in China at the time, it, it isn't listed as sort of even a major war. It's sort of listed as a border skirmish in the military annals of the time. It's an extremely small affair compared to something like the White Lotus Rebellion or the Taiping Rebellion that would come later. Um, so why does it resonate so large in the Chinese psyche? Then? Because the, don't hear about the, White well, Rebellion. the symbolism of it is just unlimited. And the Opium War, I mean, this is this is one of the great ironies about the war. The name that we call this war, the Opium War, was an English language name for it, coined by critics at the time. The Times of London, which was dead set against this war, called it a flagitious and flagitious and murderous war. Um, called it the Opium War because it was such a disgrace to Great Britain to be fighting on behalf of drug dealers. So the, the, the opponents and the critics of the war at the time that it broke out hammered on this theme that Britain is going to war over opium dealers, our, our honor will be tarnished, it will be a black mark on us forever, nobody will ever respect Britain again, etc., etc., etc. In China, it doesn't get called the Opium War until the 20th century. And it's, um, and it's in the nationalist era. It's in the 1920s and 30s that the Opium War is sort of elevated to the status of the beginning of the modern era, or this moment when China was dragged forcibly into the modern era of imperialism. I mean, it's still taken as the starting point of modern history. But this, is, this is the starting point. Um, and it was for, I mean, it was for propaganda purposes. It was for, it was part of the campaign of, uh, to keep national humiliation, to bring the Chinese together against outside enemies. Um, and this is something that's carried forward. Chiang Kai-shek built on it now, um, you know, it carries forward, and now Xi Jinping is, make, is using this as, as very good currency as well. I think he refers in his speeches, I mean, just flipping through the governance of China, he talks about the 170-year struggle, now it's the 175-year um, struggle for national rejuvenation begins at the Opium War. But this is year zero of the struggle for China to come back again to the, to the strength that it had in the past. And I think the nuances of the war are far less important than the symbolism of it. That this is the war where the British forced opium down the throats of the Chinese, um, where they forced open, where they showed our weakness, bared our weaknesses to the world, um, and introduced an era where there's going to be war after war after war in the same moment. So again, sort of trying to put myself in Xi Jinping's shoes, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, you know, there's part of me that feels like, God, you know, China is becoming rich and you know Fuqiang is becoming rich and is becoming powerful and becoming very modern in many ways, a country that faces huge challenges, etc. But it's kind of like, you know, when is China gonna get over it? You can get over the sort of uh, <coughs> perpetual obsession with how we've been kept down and we've been kept down and which which of course feeds nationalism. But there's another part of it feels like if you're Xi Jinping and you're remembering that history, I mean, my God, it's terrifying. And that is your, there's nothing more important than, um, you know, preserving the bureaucracy. You could you could argue the preservation of the Communist Party, kind of central, re-centralizing power in the Communist Party is about that, certainly all about stability, right? Um, and there's nothing more important than that. So kind of, yeah. I, I don't know what you guys think about that. Well, I think that. I mean, the opium war, just what Steve was, was saying about the unlimited symbolism, the opium war is too, is too good to give up. <laughs> and I think, I think Steve is right. The details of the war are very much, I mean, they're not better understood in China than they are in the, in the United States, and it's not very well known how it came about. But the name says everything. It's the opium war, so therefore the British imposed it, and the Chinese lost it. I guess that's all you need to know. And I think that for, for I mean, the, frankly, the lesson since 1989 for the Chinese government is that um, nationalism is going to be the it's going to be the tonic that's going to hold going to hold the country together and it's going to open up their their power um, and so when we talked about you know, like, like Jeff Walsh's 
was codified through the bargain, bargain between the Chinese government uh, being able to rule uh, as long as it you know, delivers quite literally the goods to the population. And so that's, you know, economic growth is one piece of that. That's undermined by the in inevitability of an economic slowdown. Um, and then environmental degradation, so there's, you know, that, that balance is no longer so easy. You can't deliver on limited economic progress. But what you still have is a tool of nationalism. And so that's, I mean, I don't think there's a great interest in doing it up. I mean, the, the cliche that, uh, that, or the metaphor, cliche, the, the metaphor that some people will use is the notion of, of Chinese nationalism as a kind of like flame, and that the Communist Party stands there with, you know, with the gasoline in one hand and garden hose in the other. And so if it wants a little, little stronger, fancy with gasoline, and it gets too hot, it pans it down a little bit. Um, you know, the opium war is just, it's just perfect for that. So I think that there's not really an interest in, in giving that up. And I don't think it, I think as China now is, ironically, China's trying to balance internal stability. It's, its threat is internal, right? I mean, China is very strong uh, internationally. I think its concern is domestically. So it is that unity, stability, and nationalism that it can use there. So it's, I don't see any reason why they would, would want to hand that up. And to just be clear, I don't think they have a unique, unique from any other country. In every country I was just going to say, yeah. put it in some global context. I mean, certainly there's the stuff that the United States has been doing of late, you know, in a very clear fashion. Is, uh, you know, drumming up nationalism. This nationalism is, is um, you know, something that governments around the world use all the time. Well, I think for an interesting thing in, in, a, in the opening war is an interesting entree in this right now is because right now, we're, I mean, we had an era of free trade, I mean, free trade in air quotes, right? Because free trade is usually defined by trade, you know, free according to the people who, who are making the rules. Um, but now we have, you know, the rise of protectionism around the world, which is ostensibly what the opium war was fought to get rid of, but the Chinese aren't permitting us to access, you know, mm -hmm. to, uh, to free markets. So now I think, I don't, I don't know what the lesson is and how it exactly maps on. I mean, the thing about history, of course, it's not the same over and over again. Um, but I think there are lessons there about the, the way that this free trade impulse is now being challenged by, um, by you know, populism, nationalism, and protections. Yeah, I mean, just I mean, the incredible irony that you know, now it's China that is billing itself as the global exemplar of free trade, while the American president sort of gazes longingly down the road of protectionism. Um, that you know, the roles have been reversed to, to a certain extent. Um, but yeah, I, sorry, go back to go back to your original question. Well, you know what I was. I guess to, I'll, I'll pick up on it and yeah. move forward with it. So Jay, you're studying Shanghai in the 1940s, and I'm curious at you know given. And okay, so think about that, think about the opium war, these really horrendous things that foreigners did do to China. I mean, that, that's all real. Um, so given that history, is it understandable that the government would be pushing for foreign companies, for example, to share their technologies with China, or to um, you know, in implementing industrial policy to ensure that China can stand up and compete in the global market? I mean, you know, given when you look at the history, does that give them a pass? Uh, I, would, I don't think it's a pass. I mean, is it understandable? Sure. I mean, absolutely. People are, you know, the Chinese government, just like any other government, they're looking back to its past and they're looking for a way in which to ensure that the mistakes that they made in the past, they don't replicate in, in the future. Uh, and, and so, you know, Shanghai, and, you know, Shanghai becomes the illustration of in many ways, the, the project I'm working on now is sort of the end of the story that Steve's book is beginning. Right. right so it, it, talk a little bit about well, the British, that. you know, the British Empire, the British trading empire, really ramps up with the Opium War, and then you have 100, this hundred years of humiliation, well, hundred years on the China coast um, that is run by you know, foreigners, but the international, many people here, I'm sure, been to Shanghai. So you have the international concession, the French concession, in the center of Shanghai. And the interesting thing about that, the unique thing about it's kind of a, it's a semi-colony, there's a lot of debate about whether you call it a colony or not, but it's a colony that's not run, in the, at least in the American and the British part, it's not run by governments, it's run by, by businesses, it's run by professional, mainly men, um, but who are not, I mean, they're very explicitly not representative of their government, they're 
are Britons, they are Americans, they are Britons of other countries, but they're but they're not exercising control as a government. Um, so in some ways, it is the it's the apotheosis of trade. Like you're, you're saying that it is really just about trade. It's not about any of these other things. It's just about, about trade that, that comes to an end in Shanghai in the 1940s. Um, but Um, but I think that to well, it's just you know the, what 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 I really want to get at was what you know what was the experience in the 1940s in Shanghai and how does that still continue to resonate today? I think I think it's I mean the experience of Shanghai is very much I mean the every people right here the old you know it's been talked about you know the signs both in the park that says you know no dogs are Chinese admitted which you know pretty well established didn't actually say that. Um, but it certainly was the case that the Chinese people were second-class citizens in Chinese territory, and that's certainly that's what is. I mean, that's valid. That's a valid memory, and it's something that the, the Chinese government is appropriately focused on not not being allowed to repeat itself. Um, so, in, in that sense, they're completely you know, they get a pass. They're completely justified in, in being sure that that China maintains uh, strength after the show of weakness. You know, I'd also point out that. <coughs> That would be the course of trade, shared technology, and things like that. I mean, that's, that's nothing new of any rising industrial power, right? In the United States, you know, Hershey's chocolate made its, made its living on stealing um, you know, British chocolate recipes and bringing them over to the United States. Right. Right. Um, all these sorts of things. So that's not to say that's right or wrong, it's that that's what people countries, countries do. Um, I think that the, I think, again, I, I, what I think is really important here to emphasize on the, the lessons of the opium war and reading this book is. is <coughs> Perfect illustration of it. It's just to try to get at the, the idea that, that you know the events of the war itself really, really can't touch the moment. I mean, I think you know when you read the book, you'll see you know it's only it's nine votes difference, right? And it has a problem. If five people had changed their vote, the war would not have been offered. Yeah. Like how would things? So no notion. This, this is five out of, out of over five hundred votes. Yeah, but it's wow. a tiny, tiny by one yeah. percent. Yeah. So again, that challenges um, the Chinese arc, or the Chinese uh, sort of, for, and, and probably the way we all sort of think about the opening of that war, that, yeah. that it was inevitable, that it was, there was an imperialistic, um, you know, sort of drive that the British had to. to yeah, that the British had this sort of bloodlust towards China. Yeah. But if they had, they had plenty of opportunities earlier to exercise it. Yeah, they, I mean, the, the opium war makes it through Parliament by a razor spread. Again, yeah, uh, nine votes out of about 522. After three <coughs> full nights of debate, this is one of the biggest debates of the year in the House of Commons. Um, the transcript is the size of a Dickens novel. It's well over 100,000. And there are people, people speaking for hours on it, yeah. these, these incredibly eloquent speeches right. um, on both sides. The one, but, and, and frankly, when you go back, the ones who are against the war are far more eloquent. And it's heartbreaking that they don't win out of the end. Yeah. Um, but to go back to, uh, to Shanghai in, in 1941, um, just to, one thing to link this together is 1941, that's when the British Empire in Asia is eclipsed by Japan. Okay. And what we're looking at today, I think, is a, an emerging consensus in the Chinese government that China is ultimately destined to eclipse America. That the U.S. is on the decline. It has been since the 2008 financial crisis. Now under Trump, it's so chaotic, and there is far more of a confidence of leaving the Western model behind. And this is one way in which the Opium War is is, is very important for Xi Jinping thought. That he sees that as the beginning of the point where the Chinese all look to Western models as being the way that you make yourself strong. And that we are now finally entering into an era where China needs to look back on its own traditions. It can still hold on to Marx and Leninism, it can still hold on to socialism and Chinese characteristics, but it can reach to the Confucian past as an alternative for, for re refashioning themselves on the Western model. Um, and again, that's something that China is shocked into by the Opium War in much of the 19th century, the, the, or at least as we talk about Chinese intellectual history. It's about intellectuals grappling with the West and how can we take what's strong, how can we strengthen ourselves in that way. And now we have a government, now we have a president of China who says maybe we don't need their model anyhow. That if you take a look at the 5,000 years of history, as he likes to, to talk about it, that in the long run it's the Chinese model that's superior. Right. And you think about how 
you know, that, that concept that, the, that there is nothing inevitable about history. And history is always shaped by individuals. And yeah. I think about various turning points in terms of the way China views the West or the Chinese government views the West. You know, one, I suppose, might have been 2008, the financial crisis, when Wang Qishan famously turned to Hank Paulson and said, our teacher is no longer looking so good. <laughs> and, you know, I wonder to what extent that, that certainly was a moment when the Chinese kind of said, whoa, you know, all this, the whole Western completely market-oriented focus maybe doesn't, doesn't work for us. And another moment, of course, was 1989, where, you know, it, there was nothing inevitable about that. There were winners and losers, and the losers didn't win the day, and, and had that not happened, there would be a very different China today. And, you know, back in those days, of course, there was lots of discussion and, and exploration of the West, and should the West be our model, and et cetera, and that was, you know, projected after that. Yeah. Well, I think, and, and emphasizing one thing that Steve said, is I think one thing that's important about 1941, and again, in, in many ways, as the end to this cycle that begins with the opium war. So after the opium war, Britain is established as a, as a model. I mean, it else happens later on, right? Not at the time, but it happens, it happens incrementally, it happens over time. But I think in 1941, because, just as Steve said, because Japan defeats the British, defeats the Americans, defeats the French I mean, in, in China, because it drives them out. Um, I think that establishes something, not at the moment, because I would say China's at war with Japan. It's not that China's alive with Japan. China's at war with Japan. Um, but I think that, that if you're looking at it in the long term, that does reframe things. So it, it enables, I mean, it's, it's really ironic, right, that the end of the century of humiliation comes not through China immediately. It comes through this other power intervening Japan, which then allows them to have something new to flower. And it takes a long time for that to sort itself out. I would say it still sort itself out. But it does present something that's very, very I mean, fundamentally different than the regime that's imposed in 1839, you know, 42. Mm -hmm. So, uh, two, two things I just uh, jotted down. One was I wanted you to talk about the kowtow. Okay. And that's, <laughs> and that's connected to, so this, and what I mean by that is that there was lots of discussion and debate mm -hmm. we talked about in the book, uh, you know, particularly during the embassies that the British sent to Beijing before the Opium War. And just, I guess my question is, does Concern, that kind of sort of nationalistic or prideful concern over the kowtow and you know giving in to some foreign power or to the emperor specifically, does that play too big a role in foreign policy in general? And then the second part of that question is, I wrote down, you know, will trade save the day? Um, that basically that's connected to it in the sense that we talked about the traders for so many, you know, for centuries were sort of doing a for everything was perfectly fine. The rapacious guys from India came, you know, from the, the, the India trade came over and started uh, becoming a point of order. Yeah. Well, trade certainly saved the day back then. Um, have you heard of the, the, the kowtow? I mean, it's now a permanent part of the English language. And any U.S. politician that wants to accommodate China is accused of kowtowing to Beijing. Uh, but it, it took on a life of its own. It was a court ceremony of the Qing Dynasty, and you would sort of bow to the ground on both knees and bang your face, and bang your head on the ground nine times. And anyone who had an audience with the emperor was expected to do this. Not just foreigners who came. It's pretty humiliating, you gotta admit. But Chinese ministers did it as well. Yes. So everybody, it wasn't just something to humiliate foreigners, it was everybody, it was a way of Halting the greatness of the emperor. Um, so yeah, so Britain sent these two, had two attempts at diplomacy with China prior to the Opium War. One is in 1792, they sent Lord McCartney, and he sort of famously refused to kowtow and agreed that he would go down on one knee and you know stand up for Britain's honor, and then he didn't get anything he wanted, and, and so everyone blamed it on him not kowtowing. <laughs> the next one doesn't come until 1816. Um, yeah, so. The first one was 1792, right. so 1816, so more than 20 years later. Why don't they send more? Because McCartney failed so badly, and the real worry about it was that, again, the emperor would be so offended that he was going to shut down trade. Um, but trade saved the day. Trade went along just fine, despite McCartney having gone and, and had his kerfuffle up, up in Beijing. So the second embassy, which is far worse than the first one, um, it's led by Lord Amherst. He's, this is the, the little-known successor to, to McCartney. Um, but Amherst goes with actually very, very modest demands. 
um, McCartney wanted the Qianlong Emperor to open up all kinds of ports for the British and give them an island offshore they could use for their warehouses um, and wanted to station a permanent ambassador in the capital. And all these things that he never would have gotten no matter how many times he cowed down. It, it just simply didn't matter. Um, Amherst comes, all he really wants is some means of communication for the British at Canton with a committee in Beijing that has the ear of the emperor. So they can, if, if something comes up, they can communicate with Beijing. Um, and also to allow them to trade with some more people in Canton. There were only a select number of, of merchant families they could, they could trade with. Um, but this is just a catastrophic um, uh, 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 embassy. Um, they asked him kowtow. I mean, it, it, actually, the, the kowtow was sort of a side issue for McCartney. It didn't, it didn't really seem like a big deal at all. The British made it into a big deal later on. Because when they didn't get anything, they could say, well, it's because we stood up for our honor. We only kneel the way we would do in England. Um, so McCartney comes, I mean, Amherst comes along. Um, again, fairly modest demands. But he comes, he's quite a bit more arrogant than McCartney. Um, McCartney comes in sort of open-eyed wonder at the grandeur of Qianlong and the Qing dynasty. Amherst is coming, the, essentially the occasion for him coming is that Britain has finally won the, the, the Napoleonic Wars. And now they are unrivaled as the, as the supreme military power in the West, and it's <coughs> Amherst's job to sort of let that be known in Beijing, so they would get a little more respect. Uh, but anyhow, so <coughs> as soon as Amherst lands, the officials going with him start getting, you know, please practice your kowtow, we want to see that you can do it properly. Here's a piece of yellow silk representing the emperor. Come on, you know, uh, they, they talk to his son, who he brought along as his page, and say, you know, like, and, 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 and they say, you know, think how bad, you know, they say to Amherst, like, think what a shame it would be for your, your little boy who came all the way here and you wouldn't even get to see the emperor because, you're, because you refused to count him. And so they go back and forth and Amherst tells them, um, it, it says, well, I, I'm going to fall back on the precedent of the McCartney mission. Um, and since he didn't have to count how, I won't count how either. And the Chinese side comes back and says, well, actually McCartney count how. And it turns out he did. Um, so he, when he was in his actual, when he was actually, I mean, so this comes out in the foreign office archives. <laughs> Amherst learns, um, so that, that McCartney probably did his down on one knee thing when he was actually in the audience with Chen Long, but at Chen Long's birthday celebration, which was a big public event, uh, McCartney got down and bowed to the ground nine times in succession with everybody else, and Amherst writes home about this saying that McCartney was wearing these huge flowing robes, and from a distance you probably couldn't tell that he wasn't, you know, that he didn't have both knees on the ground. So basically it turns out that McCartney faked it. <laughs> Still didn't get anything he wanted. Um, but the thing about Amherst is he, he gets there, things go wrong with the handling of the embassy. They're sort of dragged through the night to get to Beijing. In the end, after all of this fuss and bother, for, then, then, like, then Amherst decides, okay, I'll just do it. I mean, it seems a polite thing to do. This is the court ceremony. I will, I'll do the thing. And actually, Amherst's instructions tell him not to let any quote unquote trifling punctilio um, get in the way of a successful embassy. So it's perfectly fine if he wants to do this. Um, it's one of his advisors who happens to be the son of McCartney's advisor. Oh, okay. Whose whole reputation was based on that kowtow, who convinces him this would be terrible for Britain. But the thing is, in the end, um, right you know, at the moment before the embassy, when Amber, it's Amherst's time to go in, is Amherst like saying, it's fine, just do whatever battle we want. So the truth of the matter is that neither of Britain's ambassadors were refused an audience with the emperor for bickering about the countdown. Which is to say that the kowtow actually sends, it sends a lot more about the British than it does about the Chinese. The Chinese were actually quite flexible. Um, and when Amherst was on his way to Beijing, the Jiaqing Emperor had written in an edict to his ministers of state saying that it's better to be flexible than not, that with foreigners it's better to meet with them than to send them away. And he was perfectly willing to bend the rules of the court, and, and it was simply Amherst who refused to do it in the end. And then he, well, his embassy failed because he got into a fight in the audience chamber, and then his ship started blowing up things down in the south, and then his ship sank on the way home. Um, so he was like, actually, the embassy, the embassy was so was was so awful. Like he never actually got to see the emperor. Um, the emperor wrote, they sort of addressed an edict to the king of England, saying that perhaps it would be best in the future if you simply refrain from ever trying to send another diplomat to China. You can just be 
submiss it in your own cards, that would be fine. Um, this, you know, like this was so embarrassing for both sides that maybe you just don't send any <laughs> um, But the kowtow, a couple things about it. First of all, not all the British think that it's a big deal. And a lot of them, especially the free trade activists, think that Amherst should have kowtowed. Because they say Amherst, because the story that comes back, Amherst won't tell people the reality of what happened, which is that he was tired and hadn't gotten the chance to print himself for the audience, and his fancy suit hadn't arrived yet, so he refused to go in when he was supposed to, and then he got into a fight. He doesn't tell them that. Instead, he says that, you know, out of principle, he refused to kowtow. So he um, but the free trade activists of Britain at the time say Amherst just squandered a chance to improve our trade with China over this ridiculous matter of ceremony that it seemed perfectly respectable to follow the Qing dynasty's ceremonies in their capital. Um, and the, I mean, the strongest voice on this, the strongest critical voice here is Napoleon, uh, the defeated Napoleon, who's on St. Helena. Um, Amherst stops off on the way back to meet with him. Um, and, Amherst, and, and Napoleon has this conversation about China with his, with his Irish doctor, who's with him to get out of And they're talking about the Amherst mission. And Napoleon just off on Amherst, and he's saying, you know, well, if I had sent an ambassador to China, I would have had him kowtow immediately. It's, um, it's simply a matter of respect. If you were in a foreign court, you follow their customs. He said, how can the British be so arrogant as to think that when they are in Beijing, the emperor of China would follow their protocols? Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's the old general. He says, well, if it were the custom of the, of the British to kiss their king on his ass, <laughs> would they go to Beijing and ask the emperor to drop his pants? <laughs> <laughs> and this was actually really widespread in terms of criticism. The, the kowtow at the time seemed a non-issue. Um, a lot of critics in Britain said that this is just too much fussing over honor. We should have just done it. We should be more practical about our relations with China. But it gains a new life in the midst of the opium war. And it gets dragged back up as being a hindsight justification for the war. That the proponents of the war, who want to deny that it has anything to do with opium, say that this war must be fought because the Chinese refuse to treat us as equals. And this spreads. And actually, I mean, the Americans on the whole were harshly critical of the opium war. Um, one exception was John Quincy Adams who in 1841, to a very hostile audience at the Massachusetts Historical Society, argued, argued in favor of Britain going to war in China, and sort of shouted to them, the cause of the war is the kowtow. And, and he said that, it, as he put it, the, this war in China has no more to do with opium than the American Revolution was caused by tea. He said, the issue is that the Chinese have refused to treat with other countries as civilized equals, and therefore we must fight this war. So that's what becomes this immortalized kowtow to this day. Are you going to kowtow to? But the reality is that actually the Chinese government back then was far more flexible about it than the British were. I think another interesting piece, mm -hmm. we'll see what the end of the story is, but there's Napoleon argument, right? So when Napoleon is, is, says this, um, that you should kowtow because, you know, because why wouldn't you? And then the, right, the, 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 the British representatives are talking with them. That we have the Royal Navy. Barry O'Meara. Yeah. <laughs> we, we have the Royal Navy we can fall back on. And Napoleon, you know, I think the way he put it, his, eye, his, his eyes darkened or whatever. Yeah. But you know, Napoleon looks at that's a, that's a terrible idea because if you send the Navy into China, look at look at the size of China, look what China's capable of. If you go if you go and start a war with China, eventually they're gonna build a fleet and they're gonna sail over and they're gonna attack London. Um, and of course that's silly. Now we're <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that there's you know I think there's an interest a lot of interesting questions to be raised that we you know I mean historians were always fighting against the idea of seeing the past in terms of the present I mean the present's the only one we've got with all apologies to Doctor Who but I think that the, the idea here is that we see everything that's leading up to this one present but of course we're only in the middle yes. right I mean I think it's very important to remember that we're not at the end of anything we're in the middle of something um, and so I, I, um, this whole day of the, the retro the retroactive invocation of the kowtow as the cause of the war, you know, the retroactive invocation of 2008 as the end of you know, the Western hegemony over the global financial um, state. I mean, all these things, it's, it's still to be told what are, what are going to be the important facts to pick out later on. And right now, the opium war has been picked out as a really important fact 
went for this, this long period of time, it has different meanings for different, different folks. So the point may, may yet be right. You know. So we want to allow people to ask some questions, but but again, that, that question <coughs> will trade save the day. I mean, let's flip to today now. Um, you know, we've got these incredible trade tensions, and you know, I, I, I remember actually the other day having a conversation with a Chinese businessman who was just basically saying, oh my God, you know, both presidents should just, you know, long jing xiao lai. You know, they should yeah. just like cool down, just cool it. Um, so, you know, is that a lesson to be taken away from all this? That trade is, that somehow <laughs> yeah. things go better when relations are based on I mean, you don't, trade? I, I, I don't, well, it doesn't want to make sort of flat out prescriptions yes. like that. But I mean, looking at the, I mean, looking at the, you know, at this past era when China was strong, yeah. when it was a power to be reckoned with, um, it was a, a, at a time when, as foreigners saw it, China just felt disdain for the West. You know, these famous lines from the uh, from Chen Long's edict to the King of England: you know, "We possess all things; we don't need any of your silly manufacturers." That was just Chen Long knew very well that China needed Western trade. They needed the silver that was coming in through it. They needed the employment in the South. Um, the British benefited enormously. And one thing that you see on both sides in this era prior to the Opium War is a strong and abiding faith in trade as a stabilizing factor. Um, there is another sort of fiction about China prior to the Opium this is sort of, so you have those sort of Chinese nationalist versions of the Opium War history. There are the stock Western versions of the Opium War, which is sort of this wink, wink, ah, the triumph of the West and these silly people who tried to look down on the British and then we taught them a lesson. And this is how it's been told the West for a very, very long time. Um, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. Wait, remind me of your question. It was just, um, let's see what was Oh, trade. Trade, exactly. Trade. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so, and, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Um, so, so there's this fiction that the Chinese prior to the Opium War were oblivious to British power. And that China was shocked into awareness of the rise of the West by this war. That's not true at all. Coastal officials in China who actually had contact with the British knew full well how powerful their naval ships were. And they wrote about them and they described them and how big they were and how far their cannons could shoot. But the conclusion, I mean, at least everything that I've seen in their writings, the conclusion is always that as long as we have a peaceful trade with the British, there is no reason they would ever need to use these in China. And you hear that on the British side as well, and it's the belief of the British government. As long as there's stable trade, there's no need to resort to, to military power. I guess my one thing I say, and I want to make sure you have a chance to ask questions, I think that the it's really important to keep an eye on both sides, the contingency that was there. So we already talked about in Parliament just how close the vote was. But we also talked about it on the Chinese side, on the Qing side, I should say, on the Qing side. Right there, they were a lot of people entertaining and legalizing opium, right? There are a lot of people entertaining very different approaches. This wasn't the only opium crisis that they were dealing with, right? They were, they were also in the Northwest, they were very different ways of dealing with, with opium trade on various and various border communities. So it's a very this inevitability, and there, there, there are two yes. things in history we say is more inevitable as the Opium War, and yet it was very contingent by just a few actors on both sides. And I think that that's a lesson, I mean, in terms of lessons, I think it's a lesson for all of us nowadays to um, think about. I mean, we have a tendency to have the idea that big processes are beyond control of individuals, and certainly one person can't change the fate of the world, except that one person can. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, and the single most important individual in the middle of the Opium War was, of course, Lin Zexu, the Chinese minister who conducted the crackdown on, on the British trade. And he's the one, he was or scapegoated in his own time, but now he's elevated as a nationalist hero. He's the one, there's a statue of him in Chinatown in New York that says, pioneer of the war on drugs. Um, and he's sort of the, the upstanding Chinese minister who stood up to the British on moral grounds to stop the opium trade. His earlier thoughts on opium, and the first thing that he has to say about opium is a few years earlier, in 1833, um, he writes to the emperor who's been soliciting opinions about what to do about the silver drain out of China for the opium trade. And Lin Zixu's proposal then is, well, if we're losing Chinese silver to this illegal opium trade on the coast, probably the best solution is for the Chinese to make more opium. 
And if we grow more poppies here, then Chinese will buy it from each other and no silver will leave the country. Problem solved. <laughs> and obviously he comes to a completely different view by the time we get to the late 1830s. That, and I mean, the pioneer of the war on drugs not only wanted to crack down on the British, he also wanted to give Chinese opium smokers one year to get off the drug, and they would get help from the government, they'd get medicines and stuff, and at the end of the year, anyone left, this is part of his proposal, anyone left at the end of the year who still used opium would be executed. <laughs> okay, so on so that individuals note, can swing in yes. incredible ways. Yes, yeah. yes, so on that note, questions. Yeah. Please, this gentleman here. Can you identify yourself first? I'm Manny Ramos, a member. Um, a very interesting uh, discussion. Um, I have, my question is more in the area of the etiology of the burgeoning of uh, opium as you have been describing it so far. As I say, before it you know, became a major product, what led to that point? Given that they must have known, people individually anyway, that there is this side effect, not only the videos and what have you, but if you pursue it, <laughs> that it becomes addictive. Yeah. Um, this is a really interesting question. And the, the fact is we project China's 20th century opium problem back onto the era prior to the opium war. Um, prior to the opium war, opium was still very expensive. Um, it was generally something that only rich people could smoke. And one of the biggest issues in China, and one of the biggest reasons why the government decided to take a heavy hand in this is because the main people smoking it were government employees. <laughs> that it fit right in with the bureaucratic corruption of the time. Um, that, I mean, legalizers and suppressors alike were not generally concerned about individual, like, lower level people who smoked opium. Um, they'd say, well, you know, they're useless anyway, we can abandon them to their own destruction. Their concern was, was, was wealthy elites who were using it, um, especially all the underlings in the government offices who were, who were using it. So, all of which is to say that prior to the Opium War, it's unlikely that there were millions of people in China using opium. The actual opium being carried from India to China by British and Indian um, traders was enough to supply probably a couple hundred thousand. There were other avenues uh, through Central Asia and whatnot, but it's nothing like the millions upon millions that you have in the 20th century, by which time China is producing 10 times as much opium as it's importing from India. Um, but that basic question of why does it rise? Why does it become a problem? Because um, the opium trade exists going a long ways back. Uh, the earliest re reference I've found to, in, in Western sources is actually the, um, have any of you ever read Robinson Crusoe? Or do you know the, the story of Robinson Crusoe? There's a sequel to it called The Farther Adventures of Robinson Crusoe, um, where Robinson Crusoe has been rescued from his island. This is written in 1719, and he carries opium to China. So, so at least we have this fictitious character in 1719, uh, that was when this book was written, was carrying opium to China. When McCartney went to China, opium was being sold illegally. And McCartney's instruction from the British government said, we realize that there is a certain traffic in opium from our territories in India to China, if the Emperor of China asks you to help suppress this, please agree to do so, rather than risk the real trade, which is tea. Um, but of course, there were no, no negotiations. There was no request for that. Um, uh, even at the time of Amherst's embassy in 1816, opium is still a very expensive luxury product. Um, it's something that, that you know, again, elites, uh, Manchu courtiers use it. It's visible because so many people in government use it. Um, Amherst Embassy, uh, Amherst's group on their way back down through China was solicited for opium by officials who were wondering if they had brought any along. The inflection point comes in the 1820s. And the reason it comes about is essentially because the British East India Company does not govern all of India. So what happens is that the East India Company produces opium in Bengal, which it controls. It has a monopoly on it, it produces it, it sells it shamelessly, shamelessly with the stamp of the East India Company. This is the most expensive opium you can get in China and all the rich people want this, it's, it's you know, to give to their guests and whatnot. What happens is a rise of production in free areas of India, which are outside of British control, but which start generating opium themselves, which get shipped out of Bombay or they get shipped out of Portuguese ports in Western India. 
And the East India Company's vision is to keep a sharp lid on the production of opium to about 5,000 chests a year, which is what happened for a long time, uh, which would ensure a very high price in China, in which would help to balance out their accounts for all the tea that they're buying in China. What happens is that the, the competition with India, India gets out of control. Um, and the East India Company tries various ways to corner the market. They start buying up uh, this other, this other. Uh, so the, the East India Company's opium is called Patna, because that's the, 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 the city of the center where it's produced. The free opium is, is Malwa opium. Um, the East India Company tries, they try to buy all of the Malwa opium to corner the market themselves, which means that the opium growers in the, the free Indian states just grow more and more and more. And this creates a crisis where the, where the British no longer have any way of controlling this. And it's the competition between the Malwa and the Patna that, that sees, and then, that sees the, the product increasing more and more. So the East India Company, since it can't control Malwa, decides to produce even more in its own territories as a way of trying to shut them out of the market. And that's the competition. It's sort of, it's a, so it's a competition between British-controlled India and non-British-controlled that ultimately just saturates the market in China. Did it reach a couple more questions? No, it doesn't. Sorry. This gentleman? But they do have opium in English. Yeah. This gentleman here. Yep. Uh, hello, I am a question. I'm a Christian university. A freshman at? Rutgers University in New Jersey. All the way from here. In the rain. Thank you. Uh, yes. With my wife. Thank you. Yes. So my question is that uh, we talked about the British at the time being this foreign country coming into China, uh, trying to stop a war in order to save the problem of people. We'll talk about the wage. Can we use that example in history and look at how America is treating the chemical weapon in Syria? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I have no idea. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I, I don't know. Big, I, yeah, yeah part of I don't know what it is that the United States really policy is. It's going to change frequently. So it's hard for me to, it's hard for me to know. So it's, it's uh, according to the most recent time I could claim issue, that um, there's this um, claimed kind of weapon. You know, we're going to keep it to questions if that's OK. It was no problem. Yeah. Like, but, but please, you know, have okay. a chat afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. One more question back there. Uh, was the East India Company trying to sell <coughs> opium to any other countries, or were they rejected by anyone else? Or was it just China? They would sell to anyone who wanted it, but not really anyone who wanted it. The, the, the thing about opium is that it catches on as a social fad in China in a way that it just doesn't catch on elsewhere. I mean, there, there, are, there are pockets of, of opium use in Southeast Asia, but because it became this fashionable luxury product for wealthy urban Chinese to use and to show off at their dinner parties and to share with each other, it, it was really for like internal domestic reasons that this became faddish. Um, opium was available in England. It was perfectly legal there. You could buy it at barber shops. Um, and it, but, it, but the British ate it. They, 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 they either sort of in a liquid form or grains of it. Um, there are some very famous opium addicts in, in Britain um, who wrote, you know, in some cases, uh, Thomas de Quincey is the most famous one. He wrote this book, Confessions of an English Opium Eater describing these horrifying visions that he would have in the midst of his opium addiction. And this, these nightmares that he couldn't escape from, the British were very well aware of how dangerous opium was. Then again, there were, but, the, but the, as it was described to them, in the, in the justifiers of the Chinese opium trade, well, first of all, they tried to keep the whole thing quiet. So even as horrified British readers read Thomas de Quincey's account of being enslaved by opium, they didn't really realize that China was being flooded with opium by British traders. Um, those who did try to justify it in England said, oh, you know, basically along the lines of, oh, the Chinese can hold their own. They can hold their opium. It makes them smart. They, all these things. They say it's no worse than gin. You might as well try to regulate, you might as well try to regulate British working class people from drinking gin. They're just going to find it. Yeah. Okay, they're also motivated in China because of the big trade deficit they've got. So they're all motivated in marketing. There That's a long-term analogy, actually. <laughs> addressing the trade deficit. Um, exactly. One lesson to learn is don't address the trade deficit with OPM. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so I saw this hand up. Did you? Did you yeah. Oh, yeah. I think this well, is going to be the last, last okay. question. It's fascinating. You have so many questions and so I don't even know.
start, but I think I just sort of start off your key argument of is whether it's inevitable, right? The, the way I grew up in China, the opium war is probably in first grade and all the way up, so it's it's a, a very, very well established. But however, the details are fair. So, but I think one of the ideological sort of argument why it's inevitable is looking at it globally, right? So the Marxist, you know, the capitalism, imperialism, you know, map march, and therefore in India, Africa, everywhere already fall into the imperial empire of the West, and therefore China could not be left alone. Therefore, this is inevitable sort of the argument goes. Uh, the march of capitalism will enter China. But I, I guess my, so that's sort of whether you could sort of see that argument um, in terms of you I, I would look at it backwards. Okay. Uh, I would say that the opium war was unprecedented. It was, it, it was counterintuitive. It was baffling to most people who heard about it. And it was, to many people in Britain, it was seen as deeply immoral. But it succeeds to much surprise. And that creates a new kind of precedent, that it really marks a watershed in the discovery that you can send gunships into China and force them to open ports to your trade. And it becomes a new kind of logic of its own. It didn't have to happen. And if it hadn't happened, perhaps they would have gotten to that point anyhow. But it creates its own sort of historical necessity as it becomes imitated, uh, as the British repeat it themselves, as the French repeat it, um, as, as the Japanese come along and take their part in the late 19th century, um, that it, it has this snowball effect that this is how you could, this is how you can get trade with China. Nobody wanted, I mean, it wasn't imperialism in the sense of conquering China. Nobody ever seriously entertained the notion of colonizing China. And it was all driven by this, I mean, the, the, the irony of this all is it was all driven by this idea of free trade. That as long as we can have a, a government in China that's stable enough to keep control over the country so we don't have to do it, and as long as we have access to the ports, then all the merchants there will sell us everything we want and buy all of our goods and everything will be happy. It never worked out this way. Um, but, I, but I would say that, that Marx looking at this would be sort of dry, like seeing a pattern that was created. But one out of many possible patterns that will come. Wow, so I, I think we're going to call it a night, but thank you so much.